So as you may know, I'm a huge, huge proponent of creating regular content for your business to thrive. I believe in content marketing. But maybe you're taking me up on that. Maybe you're starting to put out a lot of content and you're asking the question, Graham, why isn't my content working? Why is nobody engaging with the content? When does the content actually drive traffic to my site and grow my business? Is there something I'm missing? Is there a right and wrong way to structure my content, whether podcast, video, or blog post, in order to get maximum engagement with my audience? Well, the answer, my friend, is yes. And today, I would like to share with you my formula for structuring the perfect blog or video post. Let's discuss. Welcome to episode 60 of The Graham Cochran Show, where I'm here to help you build your online business, work less, and live and give more. I'm your host, Graham Cochran. Pumped to be hanging out with you again today. Thanks for spending some part of your day with me. I don't know if you're listening in the morning commute or on your way back from work, or if you're taking a break in the middle of the day, or uh, if you're just dipping out on work just to dive in with me today. I'm happy to have your ear for a few minutes. I want to be real practical today. I want to break down how I structure all of my content, whether I'm writing a blog article or creating a video uh, for one of my YouTube channels or doing a podcast long form like this, or even crafting a talk for a speaking engagement or a virtual summit. I've been doing a lot of virtual summits lately, right? Because no one can meet in person. Uh, This formula works no matter how you're delivering content. If you have a piece of educational content to get across, like you want to literally download something that you know and teach it to someone, or if you just have a message to share, right? If you are a motivational speaker in nature, or you're an encourager, or you're an empowerer, or you're just trying to get your opinion across even in a practical way that people connect with it, this formula will help. And Content is one of the biggest parts of running an online business, and I talk about it all the time, and I think it's misunderstood and think it's not talked about enough. People say, yeah, you got to have a little bit of content, but really it's your sales funnel or really it's your ad strategy or whatever it is. Content is so important, and it's not just that simple that you just put out content. There is a structure to content that makes your content stand out from somebody else's. Because think about it. There could be two of us that are talking about the same topic. Let's say you and I are both um, food bloggers, okay? Uh, We're both, let's say, plant-based food bloggers. So we have a passion for helping people um, come up with recipes and eat healthy on a plant-based diet. And so we both have really good background, you know, content in our minds. We have the same experience, the same knowledge. We want to share and teach virtually the same things. But you and I could present our content in two different ways, and it would come out very different. Like, I could do a blog post, and you could do a blog post, and people might like mine better than yours, or yours better than mine, even if we're teaching the exact same topic. We could map out a year's worth of content, which I shared a while back, how to map out a year's worth of content in one day. I'll link to the video somewhere um, if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, Otherwise, just search for it. Uh, You're making a year's worth of content in one day. Um, We could have the exact same list and every week put out the same content, but one could garner more comments, more opt-ins to our email list, more loyal fans than the other. Why is that? What is the difference maker? And that's what I want to talk about today. It's not just what you say or how often you say it. It is how you package and deliver the message that really makes a difference. And some of you have been asking about this. Uh, It's been on my list to cover, um, and so I want to cover it today. So I'm going to just share with you literally my structure for creating um, posts. And I'll make one preface. There are two general things that make a blog post or a video or any kind of piece of content, a podcast, effective in my opinion, right? There's two general things. One, and the most important, is 
the topic. The topic needs to be interesting and relevant to your audience. What we're gonna talk about today is useless if you are not talking about stuff that your audience cares to hear about. So the number one thing in content is always research, is always engaging with your audience and figuring out what they care about, what pain points they have, what dreams and hopes they have, what conversations are they already having that you can just dive into, right? We're not gonna talk about that today because I talk about that ad, ad nauseum and that's a whole separate conversation. But I'm going to assume for the purposes of today's episode that you have a list of topics that you feel real confident about that most of the time your audience is really gonna like and dive in with, okay? So it starts with good content topics. The second part is then how you format or deliver that content. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Make sense? And what it comes down to is a simple five-part outline that what I'm gonna do is break that outline apart, show you the structure, explain why this outline works, and give you examples of how it can work. And then there's a couple of bonus things I'm gonna sneak in there as well for you to really spice up your content that I think really, really helps. But it starts by just outlining. And the more you make content, the faster this becomes, where it doesn't become like a big arduous process. I can sit down uh, and have an idea for what I want to talk about today, let's say, and in five, 10 minutes have my outline ready to go. So this does not have to be long. Uh, it might be long for some pieces of content, and that's fine too. But the structure is the same, whether it's a five-minute video or an hour-long presentation, the structure and the outline is the same. Ready? All right, so let me just break down. Here's the five parts, and then I'll break them down. It's the introduction, big idea one, big idea two, big idea three, and the conclusion. That's the five-part outline. If it sounds simple, you'll see how it works in a minute. And again, again, I'll share some of the spicy things you can add to at the end. But the core of your content, the stuff you're sharing, teaching, ex exposing your opinion, whatever it might be, is going to be concluded or summed up in the three big ideas. Uh, and so I think this is the meat of your content, whether it's a blog post or video or a podcast. I think you should just have three main points, not four, not two, not five. I think you should shoot for three. This is a rule of thumb. Of course, there are times where I have four. Last week is a good example. I shared four main thoughts. So this is not, you know, strict gospel. This is just a beautiful, effective psychological number, three, right? Like a good old Baptist sermon. That, that pastor has three points. And they probably are all alliterated perfectly. Like they all start with the letter L or something like that, right? But regardless, three is a magic number. There's something about three points that is easy for people to digest. Thought one, thought two, thought three. A, B, C, beginning, middle, end, right? Every good movie or story has three acts, opening act, second act, final act, right? The opening act, setting the stage, setting the tension, setting the drama, um, the arc of what's going on, setting the stakes. The second act is where there's usually a ton of conflict and it really, really heightens the stakes. And then act three usually concludes it. So there's something humanly palatable about three sections. Also, there's something about really good marketing. If you look at uh, a lot of good sales copy and marketing where there's always like three easy steps to this product working. You do this, this, and this. Or three ways this product helps you in this, this, and this. Three just seems to fit in terms of any more than three, we start to forget the other ones and we start to get lost. So like, oh, this is a lot of information. And any less than three, doesn't really harm it necessarily, uh, but it seems a little weak. So for example, if I ha if I wanted to make the case to you, because this works not only just for knowledge, but even like opinion, because a lot of content is opinion-based, right? If I wanted to make the case to you that The Last Jedi is the best of all the nine Star Wars movies in the Skywalker saga, first of all, I would never say that because I would be clobbered by the internet trolls because you're not allowed to have that opinion on the internet for whatever reason. And I don't even know if that's truly my absolute favorite, but it's really good. It's a good movie. But don't say that publicly because people will destroy you because your opinion doesn't match the opinion of the masses, and that's just a story for another day. But if I were going to, for example, say, hey, I think The Last Jedi is the best Star Wars movie of the nine, 
I wouldn't just say that opinion. People would want to know why. And I wouldn't just say it because of this reason, because I really like the opening space battle, or I really like those crystal dogs at, at the end in on the Battle of Crate. Like, it would be weird. A, those are dumb reasons. But A, it'd be weird. B, it'd be weird to have just one reason. People would want more. Okay, well, why else is it better than the other ones? So I could give a second one. Okay, well, why else? That's where the third one comes in. So when you have, if you have three reasons, it feels a little bit better. So if I said, yeah, The Last Jedi is the best, uh, this is a blog post, Last Jedi is the best Star Wars movie um, because I really thought it was cool what Rey did with all of her like powers, floating rocks and stuff at the end. People be like, weak. But if I'm like, okay, three, there's three reasons why The Last Jedi is the best Star Wars movie. Number one, it is, has a conversation about the concept of gray Jedi. The only Star Wars movie that I really know that really starts to expose the idea of gray Jedi who are neither light nor dark. Very interesting stuff that it likes to talk about and philosophize. The other movies stick to the light and dark binary thing, and it's not as interesting as The Last Jedi's gray Jedi concept. So that would be one. Uh, number two, I might say it's got the best lightsaber battle where you've got the bad guy and the good guy fighting together against another bad guy with like epic cinematography in that throne room where Snoke's guards are fighting Rey and Kylo Ren, right? So I could say that's the second reason. And the third reason could be that I love the message of Last Jedi that anyone could use the force, not just people who have the last name Skywalker or Palpatine, right? Um, or Kenobi, right? That the force actually is available to all of us and that we all have access to the force. That's a cool concept. So that might be my third reason. If See how much more compelling it is if I share three reasons as opposed to just one or two? And if I started to tack on four or five or six, it starts to feel like a listicle, right? An article that's just lists, like top 10 you know, kitchen knives on the market or top 10. Like then it just becomes long and it's not as compelling. There's something compelling about three. Uh, a, a good example would be like, I'm always talking about passive income. My entire, you know, both, both of my businesses are passive income online businesses. That's what I'm here to help you do. That's what I teach people how to do every single week. And so obviously I'm very passionate about passive income. And so for example, if I was going to write a post or make a video about why I think that the passive income model is the best business model for you, period. I could just say that it's the best, or I could share three reasons why. Number one, it's low cost and easy to start. That might be one example. It's low cost and easy to start. And then I would flesh that out, right? Um, and then the second one would be like, it has high, pri high profit margins, right? You keep virtually all the profit, which is incredible. And then two, uh, it provides ultimate flexibility. You're not trading time for dollars. So those might be my three points. So if I say, hey, I wanna make the case that passive income is the best model, why? What are the three reasons or what are the three things I'm gonna teach? Those might be my three main big ideas. Those are the three big takeaways I want people to remember. Now, within each of those big ideas, I will generally have a few sub ideas, right? And you might have three sub points for each point. That I'm not as concerned about uh, having three necessarily or sticking to that pattern, but you start to see a pattern here. So I might say it's low cost and easy to start, and I might give three supporting reasons why. Well, I would probably give you average cost of most online businesses, um, so that's one point. And then I'd probably compare it to other common businesses people start and what those startup costs are, like franchises and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then maybe I would talk about um, how frictionless it is to get started, how quickly you could get started, hence the easy thing. So that'd be three sub points under that point one, that passive income businesses are low cost and easy to start. Does that make sense? See what we're doing here? So this is where you take idea topic, what I want to talk about, what are the three main points? Sometimes you're teaching a concept, and so there's three steps. So if it were like how to craft a profitable email funnel, that might be a little less about three points or opinions. It would be step one, do this, you know, figure out your most profitable product, right? Step two, craft a, you know, five-day sequence that goes like in this, and step three, like I would probably have three steps if that's a little bit more hard educational. Either way, think of your content in threes. If you can train yourself to think in threes, three main thoughts, three main big ideas, three steps, it will give your 
content, so much more structure and flow and give you enough meat, but not too much meat that people can't remember or they get lost or your pow- the power of your, your, uh, the points you're trying to make just gets diluted. Make sense? So I start with the meat there with the three big ideas. Then I go back to the introduction because the introduction is actually more important than the meat only because if the introduction is not good or not there at all, people will never really dive into the meat, right? So much of any content you do, whether it's your free content, whether it's your actual uh, paid content that you're teaching inside your actual courses or memberships or your sales copy, especially so much of any type of content delivery is staying connected with your audience and getting them to take the next step. So if if someone, if I'm lucky enough that you watch this video or open this episode on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and start to listen for a moment, if I'm lucky enough to have your attention, it is my job to, at the very beginning, create a compelling enough intro to qualify what I'm going to be talking about so you can make sure this is what you want to hear about today and to pique your curiosity to stick around to the meat, right? That's why I have an intro at the beginning of this podcast. I I try to pique your curiosity so you'll stick around for the, the podcast. It's the same thing if you write an article. That opening paragraph or two is so important to get the people to want to continue to read. Does this make sense? It is so important that your intro uh, keeps people engaged and draws them in. And a little tip here, something that took me a while to figure out is, is and, I, and I'm not, um, I'm not an education specialist, but the more you teach and the more you learn about teaching, you understand that people learn in different ways. And there's maybe more, but there's generally three main learning profiles. There are the why people, the what people, and the how people. And if you wanted to just make blanket statements, you could almost look at your entire audience and categorize them into three different chunks. You've got people that are really hung up on the what are you going to share? Some people are really hung up on the how does it all work? And some people are more hung up on the why does this matter to me? And it is really important that you address all of them. The what's are going to just want to know what you're going to talk about and they're ready for you to get into the meat. The hows, very similar to the what's, want to know what you're going to talk about because they want you to get into the meat so that you can explain to them how this all works. They, they really care about underneath how it works. If you write an intro that's just like, here's what I'm going to talk about today, three points about whatever, that is only going to appeal to two-thirds of your audience. There will be an entire third, the why people, who are not going to care because you still have not addressed why they should care about this article or this episode of your podcast or this video. Does that make sense? So I just try to make sure that in my intros, whether it's written or in a video or podcast, that I address why this piece of content matters to them. And this is really important for sales copy also. The why is what's in it for me? What is the benefit? Do not assume that people know the benefit of what you're about to teach. You know the benefit because you're very passionate about this topic. Going back to the plant-based food blogger analogy, if I'm a a plant-based food blogger, I understand, and I'm about to explain like um, how you can get lots of protein from plants. You can get all your daily protein from plants. I know inherently, if I'm a plant-based food blogger, that that, the the why that's important is because there is a myth out there that you can't get enough protein if you're on a plant-based diet because you need meat to get protein. But the reality is you actually can get all the daily protein intake you need from only eating plants and just people have a bias towards meat because of marketing and advertising. And so I understand the why this conversation is important. Let's say if I'm a plant-based food blogger, But if someone's getting into plant-based eating, they're just looking into what veganism is or being a vegetarian or whatever, they might not know that there is this this myth. They might not have even thought about the fact that, 
oh, am I not going to get enough protein if I switch to plant-based? Like a lot of people see the health benefits and then they then they start to realize, man, do I get enough protein? Because all my meat eater friends are saying, you're not going to get enough protein. So they may not have gotten there yet. So your job would be in the intro to explain, this is important because there is a unfounded fear that if you eat plants all the time or plant-based meals only, you're going to be protein deficient. And that's not true. So addressing the why is really important if you want to make sure you're getting all three learning profiles attention in your introduction. So I like to just, just get to the heart of why this piece of content is going to be worth their time. I like to lead off with intriguing and interesting benefits um, to the reader. So for example, going back to the passive income idea, if I'm going to make the case to you that passive income is the best business model, I might craft an intro that reads like this. If you had told me 10 years ago that I could be working five hours a week have complete work freedom, and earn more than a doctor, I would have laughed in your face. That is a great intro sentence. That's not even a paragraph. You'd want to fill that out a little bit more. But just that opening sentence gets people's attention. Um, it transitions into the what and how of passive income. Um, we might like dive into the why a bit more uh, and point the, the picture of like what having a passive income business can feel like or versus what it feels like to not have a passive income business, some of the pain points of having a traditional business um, to sort of to address the why. But you see how that sentence kind of gets people's attention and it gets them intrigued and they're like, ooh. So this is your one opportunity to say, hey, come on over. This is actually going to be worth your time. This is going to be interesting. So it is very critical to craft a good intro, which is why I do it after the meet. I try to just get... Get to the part of the content that you and I want to get to, which is the stuff. That's probably what we're best at. We know what we want to say. It's hard to write intros. Don't ever write them first. Just get to the meat, then go back to the intro. Now that you know the meat and you've had some time to teach it or write it or you know outline it or whatever, uh, now you start to think about, okay, how can I get people who are coming in cold to, to stay with me for a minute and want to continue to pay attention? Intro doesn't have to be long. It just needs to tee up the rest of the content, get people's mouths watering, right? And get them interested in what lies ahead. Make sense? So three big ideas. Then we, we go and we craft the intro. Then we go to back to the end and we craft the conclusion. And this is generally the easiest part of the outline. You don't have to be that creative here. Um, but how you do your conclusion is critical to making your content actually work for you and not just be good content. This is, this is the part where we need your content to actually serve you and your brand. So there's a couple of things that I like to do in my conclusions. One is I generally try to briefly summarize the three big ideas or summarize one giant takeaway from the three big ideas. Um, so you could, you could relist the three ideas with three steps briefly. You could get to like, I love the idea of action steps. Like, here's your one action step today. Like you've learned all this stuff. Here's what I would like for you to do next to apply this material. People love that because a good teacher leads their students to the next step of application. So they're not just dumping information. They're like, here's how you could begin to apply it. And I don't always do this perfectly, but if I do it well, I'm pleased with the results because it generally helps my students. So you could maybe educate them or give your opinion, let's say, and then you could lead them up and tee them up to, hey, here's what I want you to do next to really apply this. So an action step or one big lesson that's one giant takeaway from all three steps. Um, it basically, if, if they listened to your whole podcast or watched your whole video or read your whole article, what's the one thing you want them to walk away thinking about at the end of the day? Because they might not even remember all three of your points, but what's one thing you want them to think about at the end of the day? For example, I have friends who are pastors, and so they are part of their vocation, their profession, is to publicly speak every single Sunday, right? It's called giving a sermon, preaching a sermon. And so it's a, it's a speech, in a way, every single week. Uh, and just like any other public speaker, their job is to uh, educate, motivate, inspire, empower, um, and sometimes entertain, right, uh, the, the congregation. And it's deeper than just entertainment or inspiration because truly the pastor is trying to really mold and shape his or her congregation, right? And so I want, as a pastor, my people, let's say, to leave church 
fleshing this stuff out, thinking about what was in the sermon. And if 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 the pastor just gives a lot of great points and a lot of good biblical exposition, uh, but now we don't remember much at the end of the day of what he was saying, was it effective? And so one of the things I've tried to share with my pastor friends is, man, because if they've asked if, you know for feedback, and I, I'm not a pastor, but as someone who teaches and crafts, you know, content and material week in and week out, the idea I want them to think about is what conversation do you want your families having when they drive away from church in their car? It's couples, friends, families. What's the one thing you want them talking about, discussing, thinking about? What's that one big takeaway idea? And if you can't answer that, then you probably haven't formulated your content well enough. So keep that in mind, and you want to maybe articulate that in your conclusion. So we're summarizing, we're giving them an action step of, hey, maybe take this first step towards whatever it might be. Um, like in case of the, the plant-based food blogger, it might be, you know what? Today's action step is to uh, you know read this follow-up article on myths of protein and plant-based eating. Or it could be, you know what, throw out all your meat. You know, that could be one of the action steps. I don't know. It depends on where the content was. Um, leave them with that big takeaway or, or big action step. Uh, but that's not all. Your content needs what's called a CTA. A CTA, a call to action. Uh, this is... This is a huge miss, and I, I missed this for I don't know how many years, maybe four, maybe five years, which is really sad, of writing articles and making videos where I would teach something awesome, and thankfully, my content was good, people liked it, and they stuck around with me. But I would teach something awesome, and then I would say, well, that's it for today, see you later. You know, I'd pull a, a dumb and dumber, right? Big gulp, say, well, see you later. Right, that's that's what it'd be. It would just be an awkward ending, and I'd be gone. I would miss this massive opportunity after giving so much to my audience to then ask them for something in return. And there's two things you want to ask them for, and you can alternate between the two, or you can do both. But generally, giving one CTA, one call to action per piece of content, is recommended. So the best thing you can do is ask them to opt into your email list. And no, you don't ask them to opt into your email list because no one really, at the end of the day, wants to opt into an email list. But what you do is you offer them a lead magnet. I talk about this a lot. You offer them some free gift. It could be a cheat sheet or a PDF guide, or it could be a video series, or it could be a workshop that they can watch. It could be anything that's another piece of content that's exclusive to them if they give you their email address in exchange for it. Right, it's not a public information, uh, and so there's a little bit of an exchange there. And so you offer it to them, and you call them to take action to download it, to watch it, to engage with that content, and that's how you build your email list, which is so critical for running an online business. That's that's the reason why we put out content. It's to then grow our list so that we can then build rapport with our list. This is like a qualified group of people. If the internet at large is the you know the coldest group and then people who are like our content and have engaged with our content is warmer, the people then who have opted into our email list for more content, those are the warmest leads that we can then market to in our email funnels or, or broadcast campaigns to sell our courses or our membership sites or our coaching or our masterminds or whatever we're offering. Makes sense? So you want to call them to opt in for your lead magnet, number one, or answer a specific question in a comment below. And I find that a lot of people say, Graham, I'm asking people to leave a comment, but they don't leave comments. Well, there's two reasons why they're not leaving comments. One, you probably have a small audience, and statistically, most people do not comment. Most people lurk. Most people just read and move on, watch and move on, listen and move on. They might love you and love your stuff, but they just aren't the type of people to comment. And anecdotally, I would say most people are that. They don't comment. Now, there's a lot of people that do, but to start to see a lot of comments, generally speaking, you're going to need a larger group of people engaging with your content for that statistical slice to be noticeable. But two, I think one of the biggest reasons why people don't get comments is because they don't give good leading questions. The content creator will just say, there's the three points. Leave me a comment below. Let me know what you think. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know if you have any questions. It's too open-ended. It causes people to have to think. You can't make people think. You got to remove all thinking 
for your people. So the best way to get a comment is to ask them a specific, easy to answer question. I'll give you an example. A few weeks ago, I was doing a couple of posts on the recording revolution, a couple of videos where I was sharing my top three favorite um, plugins for making my vocals sound good. It doesn't matter what plugins are if you're not a music person, but there are things that you can buy, pieces of software that can, think of them as like filters, right? You know what a filter is on your Instagram photo. Think of it like an audio filter in a way. That's kind of simplistic. But people always want to buy all these different ones and they think one certain plugin will make their recording sound better. And so they always ask me, Graham, what are your favorite ones that you use? So I was sharing my top three and showing how they work and why I like them. And at the end of that post, I asked this question. What is your favorite vocal plugin? Leave a comment below and let me know. Now that is great because A, they don't have to think about what should I comment with? Do I have any questions? Do I have any thoughts? When you say, leave me a comment if you have any thoughts or questions, or what do you think? Now they have to think about what do they think about what you just said. But if you ask a specific question, what is your favorite plugin? We've been talking about mine, what is yours? Well, now they have to think about just one thing. What is my favorite plugin? So it's very easy because you're telling them what to think about. And then two, that kind of question is asking for their opinion. And that's humankind's favorite thing to talk about is their opinion, for better or for worse. So when you can ask your audience their opinion on the subject or something specific about what you shared, you are definitely going to get more posts because people can't wait to start talking and share what they think. And you want people's comments for two reasons. One, if you're on a blog, comments create what are called user-generated content or what is called user-generated content. If I have a blog post, all the words in my blog post can be crawled by Google and Bing and all these search engines. And so that's how I get search engine optimization. That's how I get discovered on the internet is people type in you know, plant-based diet and protein. Oh, if I have an article on plant-based diet and protein, I have a chance of showing up in a Google search. That's how people find me eventually get on my email list, buy my stuff, period. All the words in your post are searchable. If you can get 100 people, 50 people, 20 people, 10 people to comment and, and start to answer questions and have, create more words on your blog post, those words too can be crawled by search engines. Have you ever noticed that when you search for something on Google, sometimes you'll see something come up, you'll click on it, and then you can't find that paragraph that was shown in the preview of the search results. You can't find it anywhere in the, the blog post. And then you start to realize it wasn't in the actual blog post, it was in someone's comment to the blog post that I saw in the search result. That, my friend, is user-generated content, and that is your all audience and your following helping you get higher ranking in Google and be more discoverable. Make sense? So user-generated content is amazing. That is one reason why I still get traffic from articles I wrote years ago on the Recording Revolution because I got 100, 200, 300 comments on a very controversial blog post, let's say. It's all good for me, no matter whether they hate me or like me, because whatever words they're typing are searchable and allow more points of access to that blog post for me. If you are on a platform like YouTube, let's say, the more comments you get, or even Instagram or Facebook, although I'm not really talking about content for those platforms, but it can apply. But if you're on YouTube, for example, the more comments you get, the higher points you get in the, the algorithm for YouTube because of engagement, right? Relevancy uh, is key for YouTube. And so they measure relevancy by two factors. One is by watch time. How many minutes are people watching your videos on YouTube is most critical. And then two is comments and engagement. If a lot of people are engaging with a video, YouTube assumes naturally that it's relevant. It's it's what people want. If nobody's commenting, it's probably less relevant. So the more comments you get, the higher you will rank in a YouTube search. So comments are critical for you, whether you have a written blog post or even you know a, a podcast that you embed and have a written blog post version or a video on YouTube because it helps you show up higher in search results. So both are important to your brand moving forward. You just need to decide which is more relevant to that piece of content. I tend to lean on always offering the lead magnet because what I really want at the end of the day is people on my email list, not to rank higher on YouTube. Although ranking higher on YouTube is good for me, but again, that's a means to the end of then getting more people on my email list. So both are important, but opting into your email list is ultimately the big one. So that's the five-part outline. 
you know, killer intro that addresses the why, what, and how, uh, or at least addresses the why this is going to be important. Three main big ideas, the meat of your article, and then a good conclusion that gives them a focused final thought and calls them to take action. But let me give you a couple of bonus things to spice your content up, and then we'll wrap this up. We don't want to just deliver good content, right? We want to deliver incredible content that people go, wow, this was really good. This was something unique. This was something memorable. And if you have a great personality or you're very good on camera or you just have a flourish for writing, you might be able to create really good, memorable content more naturally. But for the rest of us, there are some functional, simple things we can do to make really good content. And one of the best ways to add value to any piece of content is is what's called value shots. Value shots. I learned this from Ramit Sethi, who's a brilliant marketer and author, and he runs a couple of great websites, growthlab.com and IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com. And uh, what we're doing here simply is like, after you've done this outline, after you've got the three main big ideas, is we're looking at those main points, main big ideas, and seeing if we can inject one of the following elements to each one of those ideas just to spice it up. So here's some examples of value shots. This will make more sense. And then you can see how we can add these or pepper these into our content. Um, Charts, graphs, or images. So if you're doing a visual medium like a written blog post or a video, if you can add a chart or add a graph or an image to support what you're talking about, that spices up the content, right? So if we're talking about uh, the plant-based diet, how it's, it's, you can get all the protein you need on a plant-based diet, contrary to popular belief, maybe have a a chart of like how much protein is in, you know, a a chicken, you know, a chicken breast and how much protein is in a a spinach salad, you know, with, I don't know, potato, like a baked potato or something like that, or black beans or something like that. So some kind of chart or graph or something, just a visual element, right? Um, Relevant quote from somebody. I love to bring in quotes that support my idea. Um, It's great because A, it can validate what you're talking about. B, it can give something that's shareable or tweetable or quotable. C, it can show that you're well-read, which garners a little bit of respect. D, it's cool if, if you really like to support the person you're quoting because it can draw attention to someone you really respect and then you're sharing their message with your audience. Relevant quotes are great. A funny image or a meme. So this is just when you're using an image purely for humor to keep things light. That's fun to do and obviously really trendy in the last couple of years. Uh, A personal story. If it's relevant to what you're talking about, a personal story works really, really well. Stories, people love stories. So even if you don't don't have to go on a long rant with a story, but even a simple personal story to drive a point home is a nice value shot. Um, Embedding an additional video into your blog post, or if you're doing a YouTube video, linking to another video that explains something you've talked about before. So for example, if on this episode, I was talking about Parkinson's law, if I mentioned that or the 80-20 rule, I could say, I've done a whole video on Parkinson's law on how you know you can get more and done in less time or same thing with the 80-20 rule. And so I could link to additional video content that I've done. That just adds more value. Like, oh, I should go check out that video. Research or data on the subject. Again, a lot of people really are critically minded. So if you, if you happen to like research or perhaps you need a lot of research to quantify what you're saying, and some content does need research or could really be substantiated by good research, then go do the research and bring it into your content instead of just saying the result of the research. You could go do more and bring it in. And then just humor in general. If you can be funny, if you can be lighthearted, you could be teaching. So two people could be teaching about plant-based diets and protein, and one person can be just straight and narrow, buttoned up, here's the truth, and it could be very factual and very helpful and true, but then the next person could say the same content, but be funny and just have a couple of jokes in there, just some really snarky lines or some good puns or something, or self-deprecating about, you know, you know, know, eating, eating grass or whatever it would be. Like the one with a little more humor, what is that going to do? That's going to connect more with your audience because we love people that are funny and it makes you more personal. And it's not changing the content. It's only enhancing the content, right? So all I do is I'll look at a big idea, one of my main points, and I'll ask myself, what value shot can I add here that will drive this point home or make it more interesting? 
right? So again, charts, graphs, or images, a relevant quote from someone, a funny image or meme, a personal story that's relevant. Those are some of my favorites. An additional video that's relevant that you've done or someone else has done. Research or data on the subject or just humor in general. Look, there are, And there are a million ways to do this. But the effect is powerful because what it does is it adds additional value to each of your points. It just makes your content seem really well thought out and really rich. So, you know, in review, my outline would probably have the three main points with an accompanying value shot for each. Makes sense? So value shots. And then the final piece of the puzzle is ironically the first thing people will see when it relates to your content, and that is the title. The title is so important. Um, and you want to do this last. You might have a dummy title, like an idea of what you're going to be talking about. Um, like again, with the plant-based, you know, protein example that I guess I'm coming back to. The, the dummy title might be why you can get plenty of protein from plant-based eating, let's say. That's your dummy title. That's the main, you know, general topic that you're going to cover. But once you have crafted the three main big ideas or done the piece of content, once you've done the introduction, once you've done the, the strategic conclusion, you've added the value shots, we go back to the principle of people will only continue down engaging with your content if the first thing they see is enticing. So we have to go back to the most important element of any of your content, which is the title. And this is what gets people into trouble when they do one of two things. They either create a clickbaity title, something that is so preposterously, stupidly, I have to click on this, lying, you know, to get people to, to engage with your content. Or that's one mistake they make. The other folly is being so critical of clickbait that they refuse to be creative and interesting. And they just say, I'm going to have a straightforward title and it's not going to be clickbait. <laughs> then my friend, no one's going to click on it. Because in a sea of a billion videos a day or whatever is going out, a billion podcasts, articles, if your title is just straight up like why plant-based eating is fine or why you can get plenty of protein on plant-based eating. If it's just that, you're hurting your chances of someone actually engaging with your content. There is a middle ground between clickbait and boring. Clickbait is when you trick somebody into clicking. You bait them into clicking. They click. When they get there, it's not what they expected. That's clickbait. Having a an, an provocative or an interesting or an intriguing title is not clickbait. That's just called good journalism. That's just call. I mean, that's what newspaper editors have been doing for years. The the journalist writes an article. The editor's job is to craft a, you know, a punchy, short, provocative title that gets people to read the article. Like that's that's one. That's like content one hundred and one. Have a good title. So, um, there's two goals with a title. One is you want to have clarity, right? You want to have clarity and clearly spell out what they can expect from the title. That's where we we protect yourself from clickbait. We want to make sure they know what they're getting themselves into because that's part of the content. We want to, we want people to engage with content they want to engage with. So make it clear what they can expect from the post. And then two, we want to create intrigue and curiosity, right? So we don't want to be vague. So for example, if the post, if I'm going to do that passive income post, why I think passive income is the best business model, um, I should probably mention the phrase passive income in the title somewhere, right? Um, just so they know what I'm going to talk about. So I, I don't want to get cute and, and trick them into clicking on my post. So I want to be clear, but then I want to make it a little bit more interesting. So I, I thought of some ideas for the passive income post where I can maybe have the title stand out. So let me give you three and I'd love to know which one is more appealing to you. Uh, so one is, how to start a passive income business. Okay, that's one potential title. Another is the truth about passive income. And the third would be passive income from skeptic to success story. Which of those titles is more appealing to you? Which of those three would you click on? How to start a passive income business, the truth about passive income, or passive income from skeptic to success story. So the first, they're all good, kind of. The first one is fine, totally fine. It's just average. It's just average. Um, I'm sure a million people have a post called exactly that. Uh, so the second one is a bit more interesting to me because 
Um, it seems to question the idea of passive income so that there's maybe lies about passive income. If this post is gonna share with you the truth about passive income, that's a little bit more interesting. Um, and of course, it's always great to, to say that you have the truth about something um, that's subjective <laughs> uh, because people are like, huh, does he know something I don't know? So I like the second one, but I think the third is my favorite. And for two reasons. One, uh, this is the passive income from skeptic to success story. One, it likely appeals to skeptics and believers alike. So if someone saw the article and they don't believe in passive income and they saw the title, they actually might be more interested in clicking on it because I mentioned from skeptic to success story. They may not want to believe in passive income, but they might be curious to hear how I was a skeptic or how someone, maybe it's a profile of a student of mine, was a skeptic at one point. So that that actually might bring them in. And for sure, believers in passive income who are looking to start passive income are going to want to engage with it because they want to see a success story. Um, second reason I like it is that people love to hear about conversion or transformation stories, right? Again, story, 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 but especially transformation as a human race, we just love transformation, whether it's a, a simple house renovation project or it's a weight loss, physical health transformation. Um, we just love to see people transform. We love before and after photos and before and after stories, uh, rags to riches, whatever it would be. So, you know, if I went with that third title, I, I would likely need to make sure that my introduction alluded to my perspective shift on passive income and that might make it a bit of a longer intro. Uh, but other than that, I think the core content could be the same for either of those titles. So did you see what we did there? We crafted a headline that would appeal to people. So we want it to be appealing and intriguing while still being clear about what we're going to talk about. So that's why I do the title last because it's the most important thing. It's gonna be what makes people think about clicking the YouTube thumbnail or clicking on my uh, link in the email or clicking on it when it pops up in their podcast feed, like, am I interested in Graham's podcast this week or not? The title is really, really important. So you're trying to balance that clarity and curiosity and intrigue. And there you have it. That's my five-part outline for crafting a killer piece of content, whether it's video, written, or podcast. Uh, so two things. One, I have a question for you. Which of these elements of my structure for creating content do you feel like you need to work the most at, that you're the weakest at? Is it having the three main ideas? Is it your introductions? Is it your conclusions? Or is it the title? Just, just share with me below. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, shoot me an email. Graham at GrahamCochran.com. We can dialogue this about this too or leave it in a review. But if you're watching on YouTube, leave me a comment below and let me know which of those elements you feel like are you, you weakest at and you want to work harder on. I'd love to engage with you there. And then second, if you have been putting out content or you're beginning to put out content, you're starting to buy into this idea of content, but you don't know how to turn your content or use or leverage your content into a machine that feeds your bank account money and you don't know how it really functions strategically within your business. Like Graham, I'm growing an audience, I think, or people liking the content, but how do I grow my business? Then I want to invite you to my passive income workshop. What I'd like you to do is go to grahamcochran.com slash workshop. I'm going to put the link below in the YouTube description and give me 45 minutes of your time. Watch this workshop. You're going to see content be part of one of these four components to passive income. And I want you to see how the content fits within the other three components, what tools I'm using to integrate all four of those, and how you can monetize your content to create your first $1,000 a month of passive income, even if you have only 30, day, 30 minutes a day to chip away at it. That's what I want you to come watch, and then I want you to apply that material. It's absolutely free, grahamcochran.com slash workshop. Check it out, apply it, and dive in. That's all I got for you today, my friend. Thank you for hanging out with me. Thanks for listening. I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope you're staying healthy and safe, and uh, I'll see you on another video real soon. Bye.